Well, welcome back. We're ready for our next speaker. Um, and before I introduce our next speaker, I'd like to let you know that you can follow along in your program on page 13. Her PowerPoint presentation is in there. Might be a little bit easier for you to follow there. Um, and also, she has a table out in the uh, showcase area where she has her book uh, that you might be interested in as well. So uh, after you hear her speak, you might want to pursue that as well. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Kari Bennett. And uh, I think I mispronounced her name, but Barrett was her last name. But I got it the second time around. So welcome to our conference. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. Are you coming in? People are like meandering in. I'll put my water down. We've got a lot of good things to cover. You can see me up in the PowerPoint. No, you can't. They're going to get it. There it is. I lead hiking tours to Norway. So that's me in Norway leading a hiking tour. And I love that picture. But I'm also, I'm a caregiver. Not only am I a professional caregiver, because I work in this industry, but I have a sister with Huntington's disease. And my mother had Huntington's disease, and my grandfather had Huntington's disease. Guess who has a 50% chance of getting Huntington's disease? So unlike Parkinson's, it's a genetic thing, 50-50. But similarities with Parkinson's disease, especially in the behavior and some of the movement things. So are we ready to rock and roll? You got all moved and grooved? with the last presentation. So we're gonna talk today about family caregiving and I wanna put a picture, my favorite picture of the lizard because that's your old brain. You following me? You're gonna. And that's the old you because if you see how the brain is formed, you see that lizard part, the stem? That's way back here where the hippocampus and the temporal lobe and right below that, that's the oldest part of your brain and that's where the amygdala sits and that's the seat of emotions. That's the flight or fight. So I was just talking with someone in the audience. So that's when the person to whom you're giving care does something and you panic. Or like with my sister, this past weekend I was at a wedding in Vermont and she decided she was gonna take up smoking again and have a few cocktails and call for her migraine medication. All at the same time, I panicked and I yelled at her instead of taking that deep breath and stepping back. That's the lizard brain. So we're gonna look at taming that lizard brain here this morning. So there's my sister with Huntington's. So she lives in Northfield, Minnesota and I live in Northfield, Minnesota. And I'm the one that she calls every morning, sometimes at 7 a.m. There are a few people in this room who know me. I am not awake at 7 a.m. I may be up, but I'm not awake. So she called me one morning, and I said, Ann, it's 7 o'clock. And I hung up the phone. Now, part of the thing is, and I bet you you understand this too, what's the disease and what's the person? What's the disease and what's the person? You bet. But, they, but you know what? I know the personality of my sister and who she has been and who she was. And I know that we weren't best of friends growing up. So part of it is how do I take care of myself, and that's what we're going to focus on, while I'm giving care to someone else. Because my sister, I'm going to tell you, drives me crazy. And I've got two brothers that are of very little help. Right? So that's my story. So we're going to talk about quieting the lizard. And one of the ways that I quieted the lizard in the middle of the worst month that my sister was having and I was going through a divorce, I went on a sailing trip in the middle of somewhere in Miami. <laughs> and that's how I quieted the lizard brain. So I look at this picture of me looking at the sunset and I get some centering from that. So we're here today to talk about a new paradigm of caregiving that I've come up with. So I, I'm going to walk through this because I want all of you to adopt this new paradigm of giving care. And by the way, how many of you are caregivers? Yeah. 
How many think you will be caregivers for a while? How many aren't caregivers but know you will be caregivers? Again. Yeah, we're pretty much, how, how many of you think you're going to need care? <laughs> yeah. You know, the situation, and AARP just came out with a new study, the situation is, is that we just don't have enough professional caregivers, so we're relying more on family caregivers. The trouble with that is we don't have a lot of family caregivers either because, you know, not as many kids to take care. The ratio is getting all out of whack. So here's the new paradigm of caregiving. I want you to, first of all, wake up, and that's simply to say, this is reality. This is what's going on. And we'll walk through that. The second step is to understand your past. Because like me, with my sister, we're not best friends all of a sudden. Just because she got this disease doesn't mean that I, we're now best friends. We used to fight in the shower. You know when your parents made you take showers together? Any of you have that growing up? It was a save water thing. I know there's something about taking, you know, showering with someone else would be much more fun. I get that, to save water. But I showered with my sister, and we would fight in the shower. She scratched me. So you got to understand your past. You have to learn how to reconnect in new ways. Reconnect in new ways. And that's what my table uh, of all the products I have and my publisher is it way to, ways to connect in new ways. And then you need to draw your lines. That's when we have to set boundaries. Hardest thing. Actually, the last point may be the hardest, and that is to love yourself and let go. How many of you out there love yourself? Interestingly enough, there are about five hands. What, the rest of you don't like yourselves? Or are you like me and you're Midwestern and it's too much to say you love yourself? Well, I hope you do love yourself, because that makes you love of all, it, right? I almost spoke in Norwegian there. Okay. So, whew. let's talk about some of the myths of caregiving, because this comes in the, to the first step of the new paradigm, and that's to wake up. So, one of the things is we think we should be able to handle everything that comes our way. And again, I refer to the woman I was talking with, where are you? Who we were talking about, what's the disease and what's, you know, when do I call the doctor? When do I not? And part of that is, do you know the symptoms of Parkinson's? Do you know what's going on? Can you separate those symptoms from the emotional response you're having? And that takes a moment. And what we learned about earlier, it takes a moment to breathe and center yourself and not respond out of that lizard brain. The government will pay for your help. Well, you know that's not going to be happening. And it's not going to change, so it's going to happen either. But that's just a reality. The other piece that family caregivers run into is you think you're the only one who understands. I'm the only one that can do it. No, you're not. It's just that other people will do it differently. My mother had Huntington's disease, and she did not want anyone to drive her anywhere except for my dad. Same with bathing. No one could bathe my mom except for my dad. So when hospice came in and said, we're going to have to change up your bath schedule, she said, no, uh-uh, my Dwight bathes me. She was so stubborn, she got up the next morning and she died before her bath. <laughs> are we really that stubborn? So there are things that we have to realize that caregiving is a journey that we're on that we don't know all the answers to, and that's why you have events like this, so we can get together and learn some of these things. A lot of family caregivers don't want to admit that they're family caregivers either, because that means that you're taking on a whole new role. But once you do adopt that name, and you do see it's a new role, then you can move to a place where you're looking for resources. And this is important because caregiving is a team sport. David spoke of that. Caregiving is a team sport. We need to rely on others. It doesn't make sense that you know how to do this all on your own. Why would you know how? Where is your training early on in how to care for someone with Parkinson's disease? Did you take that class in high school? We don't even have classes on aging let alone diseases, and how to give care, and how to cope with the behaviors, and the symptoms, and your emotions. So I know there's a resistance to adopting this, but once you adopt it, then you're more 
able to look for help. Now, part of the new paradigm of caregiving is understanding your past and understanding that once you get into caregiving, you awaken, you unload this suitcase of family baggage. How many of you have siblings? And how many of those siblings are helping you out? Oh, I have two hands. Wow. Now, how many of the siblings think they're helping you out? Yeah, see, and I've got more hands up. So all of a sudden, we, someone needs help in our life, and are the siblings all revert to picture yourself at your dining room table when you were growing up and you were about 12 years old and your siblings were all sitting around the table and how everybody interacted and played off each other? That's what's happening when you get back into this family caregiving thing. You all become 12 years old. But what's interestingly enough, don't expect your siblings to change. When my mom was diagnosed with end-stage liver cancer at the end of her life, I called my brothers. My sister thought they should run and get on a plane and come from the East Coast. They didn't. Of course they didn't. They're the brothers. One's meditating and one's trying to figure out where his car keys are. I mean, that's my brothers. That's just who they are. Why would I expect them to all of a sudden kick into gear? All right. There's this thing called family systems theory, and that means that whenever one person experiences stress in a family system, the whole family feels it. It doesn't matter if you're nearby or across the country or the globe, which we are these days, aren't we? This is a fun one. I'm thinking of spending half my year in Norway. That's going to go over real well with my sister, who calls me every morning right? But you have to balance between what is your life and what is your role as a caregiver. Now, I'm not married to my sister, but she is my sister. So I have to make sure that care is in place for her because her kids can't find their way out of a paper bag. <laughs> we know that when you're giving care, to care and you're a caregiver and embroiled in it, that stress levels rise. In fact, it is not uncommon for caregivers to encounter health issues while they're on the caregiving journey and or to die before their care receiver. Why is it important that you care for, take care of yourself? Because you need to be there. And if you're not there, you're of no use. So we've talked about waking up to the fact that you're going to be a caregiver, that it is part of the all of our roles really in the United States when we look at one and every other person as a caregiver. We need to understand that your family is your family. They're not going to miraculously change and step up to the plate. You also have to look at your own marriage and situation if you're married to the one you're giving care. That's not going to magically change either. The disease is going to affect it, but there's that core underlying relationship that you had. But now we need to learn how to reconnect in new ways. So you've already learned about exercise. And remember this guy, the lizard? The lizard brain doesn't want you to do new things. The lizard brain is happy sitting on the couch eating potato chips. That's the lizard brain. So, but the great news is, is we're not actually Homer Simpson. That says Bart. But we're not Homer Simpson. We don't have pea brains. We have this whole fun thing called brain plasticity. In other words, our brains are malleable. They change. They grow. And we'll talk about this more and forget less later on. And if you can work up a brain reserve, you're going to be a better caregiver. Very similar to the physical reserve that we talked about earlier. Now we're talking about the brain reserve. I've just started. I have had my second weight training session. So I'm getting into weight. My my trainer is this cuter than a button little 20-year-old guy. You know, all tight and firm and, you know, cute. <clears throat> but he gets me going. He may, well, okay, not that way. <laughs> He's a very good coach and cheers me on so that I can do these pull-ups and do all these things that I haven't done for a long time so that I can get in better shape. But your caregiving journey, it will be made easier if you are a more creative and flexible thinker, not only body-wise, but thinker. So that's what we're going to focus on here. 
So I wrote a book, The Unexpected Caregiver, and in The Unexpected Caregiver, I create, created ways to better connect, to connect in different, new and different ways. The key words is, are new and different. Because your brain is used to doing some things, but all of a sudden, if you do something new and different, your brain wakes up and you're in a better place to respond to the symptoms of any disease. So I talk about reading children's books. I talk about music, which Tammy will talk about at following me. I talk about all these different things and mental fitness is my buzzword because to do things that your brain says, whoa, I've never thought this way, makes you a better caregiver. I'll just talk a little bit about the power of music and I'll leave the rest to Tammy and the, there's another presenter too who will talk on music, but just look at this guy here. This is a guy with traumatic brain injury before music and then the aides smartly put on music from his era and he became that. He's lightened up. So we know that your brain benefits from music. I mean, look at that. All that lit up activity happening in your, happening in your brain. That's what you want. So one of the things that I did in my book is help you create playlists. And this is how you can get your grandkids and your neighbor kids, and whoever else wants to participate, involved, is they can help create a playlist for you. So I've got different playlists of different types of music because you know that music puts you in different moods. It can bring you up, it can take you down. Tammy will talk about that. It's just great stuff. But I used to go visit Grandma Gladys, who is a lot like my sister. She didn't have Huntington's, but she was drug dependent. If she didn't like her drugs, she would knock on her neighbor's door and take some of hers. And you could always go visit the guy down the hall because he had some good drugs too. You know, they shared prescription drugs, you know? But Grandma Gladys, she would be really fussy and ornery and, you know, why didn't I come by myself and why did I bring this friend? I would put on Benny Goodman on the hi-fi. Remember the old furniture that we used to have that had the stereo in it? Yep. And we would dance and things would change. There's also, I talk about coloring and the surprise you get when you color. You go from this black and white to this wee. Coloring is a great thing. This is from the coloring journal that I've got at my table, and I just love it because it's, you get something you can do together. And then you can always read children's books. Charlotte's Web is one of my favorite books, and we think that people can't read aloud, but when you read aloud, you're engaging that strong voice, and you're engaging different parts of your brain. Where is Papa going with that ax is the first line in Charlotte's Web. Who doesn't love Charlotte's Web? So children's books also give you different ways to talk about tough issues. I've got three up there. One of my favorites is Sophia and the Heart Mender. And in Sophia and the Heart Mender, this little girl has had bad dreams and she wants to draw her bad dreams out, but her teacher says no, and her parents say she's ridiculous until she finds someone who listens to her. And sometimes when we have diseases like Parkinson's and we're either caregivers or the person with Parkinson's, we could have bad dreams. And the idea is to just listen and be there to hear what these dreams are about. Not necessarily to solve, because that's something we try to, we try to solve things. We don't always have to solve things. A lot of it's just to listen. Children's books can help you do that. It's a new and different way of interacting. So we've gone through waking up and understanding your past and connecting in new ways in the new paradigm of caregiving. And now we have to draw your lines. This is probably the toughest. Because this means sometimes walking away. What do you do? How do you set up boundaries? Where, what is it that you can't say no to? What is it that you can't say no to? Do you speak up when something's driving you just crazy? Do you get out of there? 
Does how you've done things in the past rule how you're going to do things today? Do you feel inundated that, be, that people rely on you? Does that feel like a heavy burden, that people rely on you? And is it hard to say no? How many of you, by the way, find it easy to say no? Oh, I'm telling you. How many of you, how many of you say yes? Okay, no is just using a different mouth shape. <laughs> yes versus no. Now, I'm from Minnesota. By the way, do you want to know how to speak Minnesotan? This is a sideline, a non sequitur. You ready? I ain't going to pay no dollar for a corn muffin that's half dough. <laughs> so if you come up to Minnesota and you want to fit in, just practice that line. I ain't going to pay no dollar for a corn muffin that's half dough. Yeah. But see, can you all say no with me? No. I didn't hear that. No. Now, how many of you feel mean when you say no? Yes. <laughs> Why do you feel mean when you say no? Makes the other person mad. You're making the other person mad? Are you that powerful? No. You're not. You're presuming that the other person is mad because of what you said. You see where I'm going? We think we're the all and powerful Oz, that what we do affects others, but it really doesn't. It's their stuff. When I say no to my sister and she gets mad at me, it's, it's not me, it's where she's at. It feels like it's me. And of course, I have to talk to my housemate and a couple other people to reaffirm right? That I'm not crazy. But sometimes you want to say, no, I can't do this, but I will do this. How about that? No, I can't do this, but I will do this. What's the worst thing that could happen if you say no? Drop dead by lightning. That's really good. I'm going to go with that worst case scenario thing. So we have to set our boundaries. And a lot of that, just to recap, is figuring out what's, what is your limit. How can you take care of yourself? Because if you remember the slide that I showed previously that talks about the mortality rate of caregivers raises. If you don't take care of yourself, you need to take care of yourself. That's taking care of your loved one. So now we need to love ourselves and let go. By the time you leave here, you're all going to love yourself. Or you're, at least you're going to say it. Now we already have some that are, that do. So I have to tell a little story. I was born on Christmas Day, which isn't really a good thing. <laughs> because people think that you, they get by with giving you the merry birthday present or the happy Christmas present, and they think that's cute. It's not cute to a 12-year-old. It's not cute, especially when you hear your grandma say, oh, shoot, I forgot to give Kari a present. Just go grab anyone under the tree and cross off Merry Christmas and put happy birthday. That sticks with ya. <laughs> so this Christmas, I wrote this. This was my Christmas mantra this year that I've always figured I'll deal with what I want later. Well, later rarely comes when you're taking care of other people. Later rarely comes. I used to go into rooms and I would scan the temperature of the room and I would see what everyone else needed before I checked in with what I needed and then I would respond accordingly. And that, when I wrote that down, I thought, who, this is crazy making. So that, this Christmas I said, I'm going to try to be present to the moments of life and create pockets of time that I take care of myself. And in northern Minnesota in winter, that's going outside and being in the snow. The best gift I can give my family and friends is to and the world is for me to be healthy. For me to be healthy. Because then I can care for other people. 
So instead of being a Christmas angel this year, I was just a real person. As real as I could be. Because that's the other thing with being a caregiver and being a Christmas angel is you get put up on a pedestal. And when you want to take care of yourselves, it feels like you're being knocked down off that pedestal. Because what does our society say when you're giving care and not taking care of yourself? Oh, that's so good of you. Oh, that's so wonderful. When you're saying, but I'm tired. But I'm tired. So you want to make sure that you take care of you. We get into this point of emotional slavery, and that's when we are responding to others, and then, then we're taking, then we're figuring out how we need to react. We wait to see how people are feeling, and then we respond accordingly. And that's a sense of emotional slavery. So the new normal is where it's at, because here's what people say to me. As soon as we get through this move, things are going to go back to normal. As soon as we move dad into assisted living, things will go back to normal. When my sister stops smoking, things will go back to normal. Oh, she started smoking again. Now where am I? This is the new normal. Not only did I go through transition of a divorce this year, my host's son from Norway's brother committed suicide, and my best friend was diagnosed with young onset Alzheimer's disease, all within the month of January. I was tempted to say, when February comes, we'll get back to normal, but how can you get back to normal when one person is gone physically from the earth and another person has a brain disease? who is, by the way, my best friend. This is the new normal. This is how things are. And we have to learn to take care of ourselves within that. So dance. This is what I did for my birthday instead. I had people over and I danced. I danced and danced and danced and danced. And I think I am a really good dancer, by the way. <laughs> Most younger people than me are saying, not so much. <laughs> but that's my dad up there, and I was dancing with other people. I had a really good time. So I'm figuring we need to do a lot more dancing. That was the great thing about having Henrik, my host son, with me, because we spontaneously danced, erupted and danced in the middle of the kitchen. It didn't matter. It didn't matter the time of the day we danced. And you need to quiet your emotions. In other words, I'm not saying emotions are all bad, but I'm saying you need to quiet that lizard brain peace. Quiet the lizard brain peace. And one of the key ways to do that is do math. So when you're trying to figure out, do I call the doctor right now? Is this an emergency? Just sit down and do some addition. <laughs> Subtraction. I don't care. Just do it. Because what happens, and I'll talk about this and forget less remember more this afternoon, what happens is your brain, the right side, which is the seat of emotions, switches over to the left side, which is more logical and helps you think a little more creatively and a little more grounded. So do some math. Reading poetry aloud. I, my mother was my fourth grade Sunday school teacher, and I still remember the books in the New Testament because she was my teacher, and she put it to music. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philippians, New James, 1st Peter, 2nd Peter, 3 John, Student, Revelation. <laughs> right? <laughs> and there's a Norwegian poem I remember too, but the, read poetry and read it aloud. Comedy, I love good comedy. It makes you laugh, it shifts your perspective. Shift your, when I'm frustrated, I put on comedy. New and different, that's, those are the key words, new and different. If you're used to doing crossword puzzles, then do Sudoku. If you've not, never listened to opera, listen to opera. 
new and different and shift your perspective. The other thing about loving yourself is making a list of things that you like to do, that you like to do. So people who know me know that the, one of the best gifts they can send me is a $5 coffee card to Caribou or Starbucks or something like that, or a local coffee shop, because that's a treat for me, to go out to the coffee shop. That's a treat. Write it down. What, how can people best support you as the person giving care? Write it down and then hand out those lists because you know what happens. People come up to you and say, let me know if I can do anything for you. And at that moment, you're like, da, 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 da. right? Put mow the grass on your sheet. Put it on. I'm going to tell you, they might not mow like you like to mow, so what? It's done. Okay? Put dust. Dust is on my list because I think dusting is just a waste of time. Because you know what happens after you dust, right? It just comes back. My mother-in-law used to just say, it only can get so thick. <laughs> Put these things on the list for ways that you that make a sense to you and give that list out. I love Bill Cosby. I don't know what the key to success is, but the key to failure is trying to please everybody. It's so true. So I am encouraging you to love yourself. One of the most loving things I did, and by the way, this gift of sailing was given to me. I just had to show up. But it was hard to take the time because who is going to take care of my sister and deal with her issues while I was gone? Well, you know what? Other people did. And it's okay. So this is the new paradigm of caregiving that I want you to think about and take away from today. Understand that you've got a past, that this is going to be something you do. Try to reconnect in new ways. Tammy will be talking about those following me. Draw your lines and please, please love yourself and then let go. You're doing the best you can do. Thank you.